The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Renewed Optimism for Personalized Care in Advanced Pancreatic and Extrapancreatic Neuroendocrine Tumors, the Evolving Role and Clinical Applications of Emerging Strategies to Improve Patient Outcomes. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash ZDG860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello and welcome to this peer review educational event, Renewed Optimism for Personalized Care in Advanced Pancreatic and Extrapancreatic Neuroendocrine Tumors. My name is Jennifer Chan and I'm a medical oncologist at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Today, I'll be discussing the evolving role in clinical applications of emerging strategies to improve outcomes for patients with neuroendocrine tumors. We'll begin by reviewing our educational goals for today. First is to improve your understanding of current diagnostic tools to assist with identifying, staging, and rating your endocrine tumors. Second is to augment your knowledge of the latest clinical evidence on current and emerging treatment options for the management of advanced pancreatic and extrapancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Third is to provide you with tools to formulate personalized treatment plans with modern and emerging therapies and the management of neuroendocrine tumors. And lastly, to enhance your skills to address the intricacies of neuroendocrine tumor management, including appropriate care coordination, patient provider engagement, and adverse event management. This first module will provide an overview of neuroendocrine tumors focusing on diagnostic strategies and evaluation of neuroendocrine tumors. Neuroendocrine neoplasms are a diverse group of neoplasms that can originate in cells that are located in the diffuse neuroendocrine system throughout the body. We can find neuroendocrine tumors originating in essentially almost every organ in the body, but most commonly we see them arise in the lung, the pancreas, and the GI tract. Neuroendocrine cancers have a heterogeneous pathology and clinical course. They also are characterized by their ability to secrete amines and peptide hormones that can lead to symptoms of hormone excess. With regard to the epidemiology of neuroendocrine neoplasms, we have seen a sharp rise in the incidence of neuroendocrine tumors, particularly over the last several decades. We've noticed this increased incidence across all primary sites, but most notably in the lung, small intestine, rectum, and pancreas. These, in, we, these rises have been seen across all stages and grades, but most notably we have seen this in localized disease and low-grade disease. Some of the increased incidence may, for instance, be related to recognition of early disease that's detected incidentally by scans and endoscopies. With respect to the pathology of neuroendocrine neoplasms, there are important distinctions that are made according to tumor differentiation, which reflects the morphology of disease, as well as grade, which is a measure of proliferations. There is an important distinction between well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors and poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas. These are actually distinct entities that have a very different natural history and prognosis, and we approach them uh, differently for treatment. The focus of this talk will be on well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. This slide provides a summary of the 2019 WHO classification of digestive neuroendocrine neoplasms. Um, so this really is referring to GI and pancreas neuroendocrine neoplasms. As mentioned before, there is an important distinction between well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors and poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas. Within well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors, there are um, distinctions between grade one or low-grade disease, grade two or intermediate grade disease, and grade three or high grade disease. The cutoffs between these grades are based on proliferation as measured by the KI-67 proliferation index and the mitotic count. By definition, the poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas, which are an aggressive malignancy, are high grade cancers. They're also an entity of mixed neuroendocrine and non-neuroendocrine neoplasms. As also mentioned before, neuroendocrine tumors are unique in their ability to secrete peptide hormones, and the hormones that are secreted by neuroendocrine tumors will vary according to the primary tumor site. This slide lists examples of hormones that can be secreted by various neuroendocrine tumors. For instance, in the pancreas, common hormones that can be secreted include insulin, gastrin, and glucagon, and vasoactive intestinal peptide. Symptoms that patients may have if their tumors are secreting these hormones will vary depending on the impact of the hormones. For instance, patients with insulin secreting tumors will have symptoms of hypoglycemia. Patients with gastrin secreting hormones will have um, symptoms that are related to acid excess. 
organ neuroendocrine tumors, which include the lung uh, neuroendocrine tumors, thymus and upper GI neuroendocrine tumors, secrete somewhat different hormones that can include ACTH, histamine, or serotonin. The midgut neuroendocrine tumors, which include the small bowel neuroendocrine tumors and the proximal colon tumors, can also secrete serotonin, as well as other vasoactive uh, peptides like the tachykinins and the brain kinins. Hindgut neuroendocrine tumors more rarely will secrete uh, hormones that can lead to symptoms. The classic carcinoid syndrome is the hormone syndrome that we most commonly encounter in clinical practice. Around 30% of patients may have the classic carcinoid syndrome that is related to secretion of serotonin and other vasoactive peptides. Again, we most commonly see this in metastatic midgut neuroendocrine tumors, particularly if patients have liver metastases. The symptoms that patients may experience related to these hormones include flushing and diarrhea most commonly. Patients also can experience palpitations or shortness of breath. Some of the longer-term complications can include development of carcinoid heart disease, which uh, occurs when there is fibrosis of primarily the right-sided heart valve. There also can be mesenteric fibrosis that can lead to intestinal ischemia and symptoms of bowel obstruction. There are other uh, longer-term complications that can impact the skin and the nervous system. Carcinoid crisis is something that we also are quite um, watchful for because there can, in some cases, particularly if tumor is uh, manipulated, there can be carcinoid crisis that's related to kind of sudden or massive release of hormones that can cause blood pressure swings and intense symptoms like flushing. With respect to imaging of neuroendocrine tumors, we most commonly will stage the extent of disease using um, anatomic imaging with CAT scan or MRI. A couple of key points to keep in mind is that uh, neuroendocrine tumors are quite hypervascular. So when imaging the liver, it's important to consider multiphasic imaging uh, to acquire imaging in both the arterial and portal venous phase. MRI imaging also is quite helpful for following patients who might have more extensive and ill-defined uh, liver metastases because MRI imaging with hepatobiliary phase images can increase the sensitivity as well as the reproducibility of detection of liver metastases. Nuclear imaging uh, with PET-CT is also now routinely incorporated in our assessments and management of patients with neuroendocrine tumors. I'll start first with somatostatin receptor imaging. Um, somatostatin receptors are present on the surface of over 80% of well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor cells, particularly those that start in the GI tract and then pancreas. We therefore can use somatostatin receptor imaging uh, for disease assessment. Somatostatin receptor PET is the preferred imaging modality given that it has higher sensitivity as well as spatial resolution compared to older imaging modalities such as somatostatin receptor scintigraphy or ArcTH scan. And I think this slide nicely illustrates the resolution uh, that, and the sensitivity that we have with somatostatin receptor PET as shown in uh, the B panel compared with the scintigraphy on the A panel. The imaging tracers that are used for a somatostatin receptor PET now include gallium-68 dotatate, gallium-68 dotatoc, and copper 64 dotatate. Lesions on a somatostatin receptor PET are considered positive if uptake is higher than background liver. Several societies have developed appropriate use criteria for the use of somatostatin receptor PET imaging in the assessment of patients with neuroendocrine tumors. And the most common scenarios where somatostatin receptor imaging is utilized is in the initial staging after a histologic diagnosis of neuroendocrine tumors. It also can be utilized for localization of a primary tumor in patients with known metastatic disease, but where the primary tumor has not been found. And also, quite importantly, is used for selection of patients who may be candidates for somatostatin receptor-targeted peptide receptor radionuclide, or PRRT. We also can utilize FDG PET-CT scan in the assessment of patients with neuroendocrine cancers. FDG PET-CT scans will um, reflect the increased tumor metabolic activity so naturally, patients that have more highly proliferative tumors, such as well-differentiated grade 3 neuroendocrine tumors or poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas will have disease that's more avid on an FDG PET CT scan. So essentially, FDG uptake is inversely uh, correlated with grade and can also be used to differentiate grade 1 and 2 tumors from grade 3 neuroendocrine tumors. Dual PET scans with FDG PET and somatostatin receptor PET also can detect heterogeneity of disease particularly when we encounter grade 3 neuroendocrine tumors. Endoscopy also has an important role in the diagnosis um, of neuroendocrine tumors. It can, um, for instance, um, detect small and often incidental gastric, duodenal, and rectal neuroendocrine tumors. 
Endoscopic ultrasound can be incorporated to stage localized gastric, duodenal, and rectal neuroendocrine tumors by uh, better characterizing depth of invasion as well as size. By endoscopic ultrasound, we also can biopsy um, tumors to find out more information about histology and grade. Video capsule endoscopy also has a role in the workup of patients with possible neuroendocrine tumors, but I will add that um, although uh, video capsule endoscopy can be utilized, it is less sensitive and specific than surgery and also can be associated with bowel obstruction if the capsule is unable to pass through tumor. Biomarkers also have an important role in the diagnosis as well as management of neuroendocrine tumors. As mentioned before, neuroendocrine tumors can secrete various amines and polypeptide hormones. It is also possible to detect circulating DNA and RNA in both the blood and urine. When it comes to utilization of biomarkers, it can be important to assess hormone levels in patients who have symptoms that are suggestive of a possible neuroendocrine uh, tumor hormonal syndrome. Um, I also will add that assessment of nonspecific biomarkers such as chromogranin A is not um, usually recommended for routine use because while these uh, markers like chromogranin A can be prognostic, very rarely do we make treatment decisions that are based on this biomarker. In this next module, I will focus on current treatment options for patients with NED and for future treatment considerations that um, are based on recent data. I'll begin this section by just providing a very broad overview of how we approach the management of patients with advanced neuroendocrine tumors. And as mentioned before, the management really will depend on primary tumor site. So I'll start first with the approach to management of advanced GI neuroendocrine tumors. There are important principles that uh, are important to keep in mind. And one of them is that if surgery is possible to resect metastatic disease or the primary tumor, we often will take this approach first. For patients who have unresectable disease, it is not unreasonable to observe patients, particularly if patients have no symptoms, and also if there is low volume disease, particularly if it's lower grade. As a frontline therapy option, we often will consider a somatostatin analog, such as octreotide or lanreotide, particularly if there are hormone symptoms that are present and if somatostatin receptors are present on the disease. Following somatostatin analog therapy, if a clinical trial is not available, options that can be considered include everolimus, peptide receptor radionuclide therapy with lutetium-177 dotatate if disease is somatostatin receptor positive, and we also can consider local regional therapy options such as hepatic artery embolization or ablation if there's liver predominant disease. One other important point I think to keep in mind is that although we do use somatostatin analogs often in the frontline setting, in select cases where there is significant disease burden or perhaps aggressive biology, it is also appropriate to consider other frontline systemic therapy options or local regional therapy. The other important point I'd like to make is that in addition to um, efforts to control disease growth or disease proliferation, we also have to pay close attention to patients um, and the symptoms that they may be having. For example, if patients have poorly controlled uh, diarrhea, or flushing that may reflect poorly controlled carcinoid syndrome. It's important to rule on other causes of their symptoms, and then also to consider additional therapy that really is focused on symptom control. And this can include liver-directed therapy to treat liver metastases. Colotrostat ethyl is an inhibitor of serotonin production that can help with carcinoid syndrome-related diarrhea. And again, we can consider other options to treat disease. By having better control of disease, symptoms also can improve. Moving next to the management of advanced pancreas neuroendocrine tumors, similar principles also apply. Uh, for patients with well differentiated pancreas neuroendocrine tumors, we often will, if patients need systemic therapy, think about a frontline somatostatin analog. After somatostatin analog therapy, if a clinical trial is not available, options can include eberolimus or sunitinib or cacitabine and temozolomide or peptide receptor radionuclide therapy with lutetium-177 dotatate if disease is somatostatin receptor positive, or local regional therapy options. As we think about the management of advanced lung neuroendocrine tumors, again, some of the same principles and agents are relevant for the treatment of advanced lung neuroendocrine tumors. Options that can be considered to treat lung neuroendocrine tumors if a trial is not available include somatostatin analogs if disease is somatostatin receptor positive, and or if patients have a hormone syndrome. I will add that um, octreotide and lanreotide are not approved by the FDA for use in lo advanced lung neuroendocrine tumors, but it can be a treatment consideration. 
Everlimus is an approved agent for advanced uh, non-functional lung neuroendocrine tumors. And we also will consider uh, chemotherapy options such as temozolomide with or without cytobine or platinum-based therapy if patients have more aggressive tumor biology. Somatostatin receptor positive disease also potentially can be treated with lutetium-177 dotatate if there has been a progression on a somatostatin analog. But again, I will add that lutetium-177 dotatate is not yet FDA approved for the treatment of advanced lung neuroendocrine tumors. It has been encouraging over the last years to see an expansion in the number of treatment options that are available for patients. But questions do come up regarding treatment selection. And I think it's important to highlight some of the important factors that can impact treatment choice as we think about management. Some of these factors are patient-related factors such as age and performance status, as well as medical comorbidities that may influence tolerance to certain types of treatment. It's also really important to keep in mind disease-related factors. As mentioned before, it's important to think about primary tumor site because the way we approach uh, management and also the available treatment options will vary uh, between GI neuroendocrine tumors and pancreas neuroendocrine tumors and lung neuroendocrine tumors. Pathologic considerations are also important, most especially related to tumor differentiation and grade. It's also important to keep in mind the presence of somatostatin receptors because that can uh, influence whether pa patients are candidate for peptide receptor radionuclide therapy that relies on the presence of somatostatin receptors. In addition to pathologic features of disease, it's also important to keep in mind what's happening in real time with patients as we evaluate scans and assess the pace of disease progression. The next category of things to keep in mind also are the symptoms patients may be experiencing. And some of these symptoms may be related to the presence and bulk of disease. Some of the symptoms may be related to hormone secretion. So patients who have symptoms that are related to hormone secretion, we uh, term these functional neuroendocrine tumors. And the way that we approach functional neuroendocrine tumors really is to not only think about controlling disease growth and progression, but also to treat uh, symptoms. The last thing I think that is important to keep in mind is understanding the extent of disease and also understanding whether disease is localized and amenable to local regional approaches or if it's more widely metastatic. For patients who have liver or dominant disease, there are um, options that can be considered, included hepatic artery embolization or ablation approaches. And there's an emerging technology called histotripsy that may also be uh, utilized in some patients with localized liver disease. For patients with more widely metastatic disease, we really do have to think about systemic therapy options. So, so the next portion of my talk will really focus now on the uh, systemic treatment options, including somatostatin analogs, radioligand therapy, as well as molecularly targeted therapy. And to help illustrate uh, these uh, options, I'll start first with the case. So this patient, Peter, is a 68-year-old patient who was diagnosed with an advanced grade 2 pancreas neuroendocrine tumor. Some of the details regarding grade are that the KI-67 proliferation index in the biopsy was 8%, and the mitotic count was 3 per 2 millimeters squared. His staging revealed the presence of bone and liver metastases, and he was deemed not a candidate for surgical or resection based on the extent of disease. Peter did not have any symptoms of hormone excess that would indicate that he has a functional neuroendocrine tumor. So the question that comes up is what should be our first line, first uh, treatment option for, for Peter? And should we consider a somatostatin analog therapy? So I'll run through the data that will help inform this treatment decision. Although somatostatin analogs have been used for decades now to treat uh, symptoms related to hormone secretion, such as carcinoid syndrome, diarrhea related to BIP secretion, we also, in recent years, have shown that somatostatin analogs also have an anti-proliferative effect. And we've seen this best in two randomized studies. The first is the PROMID study. And this was a randomized trial that evaluated octreotide 30 milligrams IM every four weeks compared to placebo. Patients enrolled in this trial had mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors. And the trial showed that octreotide improved the median time to progression compared to placebo. The median time to progression was 14.3 months in the octreotide arm compared to six months in the placebo arm. A later clinical trial, the Clarinet trial, evaluated the somatostatin analogline reotide compared to placebo. Uh, patients in this trial had uh, non-functional GI and pancreas neuroendocrine tumors, and they were randomized to receive either lanreotide 120 milligrams every four weeks as a deep subcutaneous injection versus placebo. 
This trial also was a positive study and showed that the median progression-free survival was longer in patients who received lanreotide. The median PFS was not reached in the lanreotide arm compared to 18 months in the placebo arm. One thing that I will point out is that although both of these agents can slow disease progression, the radiographic response rate, so the amount of shrinkage that we see with these agents is quite low. Another question that comes up is whether there is an impact of higher dose somatostatin analog therapy. We don't have randomized data to help answer this question, but we have uh, seen from several clinical trials that there may be an impact of high dose somatostatin analog therapy. One trial that showed this was uh, the Netter 1 trial. This was a phase three trial that evaluated lutetium 177 dotatate in patients with mid gut neuroendocrine tumors whose disease had progressed on standard doses of octreotide. The control arm for this study was high dose octreotide LAR, 60 milligrams every four weeks. The progression-free survival in patients who received the high-dose octreotide LAR was eight months. So this progression-free survival duration of eight months does suggest there may be an impact of a higher-dose somatostatin analog on uh, disease progression. Another study that has looked at the impact of higher dosing of somatostatin analogs is the Phase two claridat forte trial. This trial evaluated patients with uh, mid-gut and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors whose disease had progressed on standard doses of um, every four-week lanreotide. Patients on this trial received uh, every two-week dosing of lanreotide. The median progression-free survival in patients with mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors who received the every two-week dosing of lanreotide was 8.3 months, you know, 5.6 months in patients with pancreas neuroendocrine tumors who received higher-dose therapy. Again, this is not randomized therapy, but these median progression-free durations of eight months and almost six months suggest that there might be a benefit of using higher dose somatostatin analog therapy before disease, uh, before treatment has to be escalated to a different agent. It is important, though, to recognize that this is not randomized data, and it's hard to know whether these results reflect the impact of the treatment or if they may perhaps reflect uh, the disease biology. There is an ongoing phase three trial that hopefully will be able to better address the question of higher dose somatostatin analog therapy. This is the phase three Sorrento trial. This is an international trial that is evaluating CAM 2029. This is a novel high exposure, high bioavailability, subcutaneous form of octreotide. In the phase three Sorrento trial, um, patients with advanced gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors who had not received any therapy or had received um, only minimal amounts of statin analog therapy were randomized to receive either CAM 2029, 20 milligrams every two weeks, or the investigator choice of standard octreotide or lanreotide. The primary endpoint of this study is progression-free survival, and we're looking forward to the readout of these trial results to, help, again, help us understand the impact of a higher dose or a higher bioavailability statin analog compared to standard treatment. So getting back to our case, um, again, Peter, who has an advanced grade two pancreas neuroendocrine tumor, um, he is initially treated with somatostatin analog, uh, but now has signs of disease progression, both with symptoms as well as on scans. He returns back to clinic and is consulting with his care team about next steps. So how would we approach uh, treatment next for Peter? So I'll start first by reviewing the systemic treatment options that are available after progression on a somatostatin analog, and they include peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. Lutetium-177 dotatate is approved for patients with advanced somatostatin receptor positive GI and, and pancreas neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, we can incorporate molecularly targeted agents. Everolinus is approved in patients with pancreas neuroendocrine tumors, as well as uh, non-functional GI and lung neuroendocrine tumors. Sunitinib is approved for patients with pancreas neuroendocrine tumors. Cytotoxic chemotherapy also can be utilized. We don't commonly utilize this in patients with well-differentiated GI neuroendocrine tumors, but it is more commonly used in patients with pancreas or lung neuroendocrine tumors. Common regimen includes temozolomide with or without capecitabine. Very rarely will we use streptozosin these days. I'll start first by reviewing the data related to peptide receptor radionuclide therapy, or what's also known as radioligand therapy. This consists of a radio-labeled somatostatin analog. The somatostatin analog is chelated with a radionuclide that can then deliver tumor subtle doses of radiation to the somatostatin receptor-positive tumor. Lutetium-177 
is one of the radionuclides that is uh, used to treat neuroendocrine tumors and, and emits beta and gamma radiation. Some of the more novel alpha emitters that are being studied in trials now include actinium-225 and lead-212. The NEDR-1 trial is a phase three trial that um, established the efficacy of lutetia-177 dotatate in mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors. This was a phase three trial that enrolled patients for progressive somatostatin receptor mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors. All patients had grade one or grade two disease and had progression on prior standard dose octreotide. There was a randomization to lutetium-177 dotatate every eight weeks, along with continuation of octreotide LAR 30 milligrams, and the comparison was high-dose octreotide 60 milligrams every four weeks. As you can see from this slide, there was a clear benefit and a significant improvement in progression-free survival with lutetium-177 dotatate. The hazard ratio for progression or death was 0.21, with a median progression-free survival that was not yet reached in the Lucetia-177 dotatate arm, compared to the control arm of 8.4 months. As you can also see from this slide, there was a higher objective tumor response rate in patients receiving Lucetia-177 dotatate. It was 18% compared to 3% in the octreotide um, high-dose LAR arm. Quality of life also was assessed in the NEDR-1 trial, and what was observed was that lutetium-177 dotatate demonstrated the significant benefit compared to high-dose octreotide in time to deterioration in patients' global health status, physical functioning, role functioning, and symptoms including diarrhea, as shown on this slide. Lutetium-177 dotatate has also demonstrated activity in other somatostatin receptor-positive neuroendocrine tumors, not just the mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors that were studied in the NEDR-1 trial. This is primarily res retrospective data or smaller uh, clinical trials. What is shown on this slide are the results of a single-center retrospective study at Erasmus that evaluated several um, uh, hundreds of patients that had uh, neuroendocrine tumors originating in a number of different sites. And as you can see from what's highlighted here, patients with pancreas uh, neuroendocrine tumors who are treated with lutetium-177 dotatate had high objective response rates to therapy of over 50% with very long and encouraging median progression-free survival. So the NADR-1 study evaluated uh, lutetium-177 dotatate in patients with grade 1 and grade 2 tumors that had progressed on st standard somatostatin analog therapy dosing. More recently, we have seen the results of the Phase 3 NADR-2 study, which was evaluating patients um, who had more aggressive disease. These were patients who had high grade 2 or grade 3 neuroendocrine tumors, really looking at whether we should incorporate lutetium-177 dotatate earlier um, as a line of therapy. So to explain the study schema of the, of the trial, this enrolled patients who had advanced well-differentiated grade 2 or grade 3 neuroendocrine tumors as measured by a KI-67 index of uh, between 10 and 55%. All patients had somatostatin receptor positive disease, and all patients had had a recent diagnosis of, uh, of a neuroendocrine tumor within uh, six months prior to study enrollment. No prior therapy uh, with PRT or no other systemic therapy was allowed. Patients were randomized to receive lutetium-177 dotatate for four cycles with continuation of uh, octreotide LAR, 30 milligrams every month, compared with um, high-dose octreotide, 60 milligrams. The primary endpoint of the study was progression-free survival. To dive a little further into the types of patients who are enrolled in the trial, you can see from uh, this slide that a little over half of patients had primary uh, pancreas neuroendocrine tumors. About 30% of patients had small intestine neuroendocrine tumors. Almost all patients had disease involving the liver, but there also were uh, a number of patients who had lymph node disease as well as disease involving the peritoneum or bone. About two-thirds of patients had grade 2 disease with a KI-67 index of between 10 and 20%, and about a third of patients had grade 3 neuroendocrine tumors. All patients had um, somatostatin receptor positive disease. The results of the NEDR2 uh, study are shown on this slide. As you can see, lutetium-177 dotatate significantly improved uh, median progression-free survival. Uh, the hazard ratio for progression or death was 0.278 in favor of patients who received lutetium-177 dotatate compared with high-dose octreotide. The median progression-free survival was 22.8 months in the lutetium-177 dotatate arm compared with 8.5 months in the control arm. 
an important secondary endpoint was objective response rate. And what was also observed was a high objective response rate of 43% in the Lutetia-177 dotatate group compared with 9% in the control group. The next slide shows a summary of the adverse events that were reported on the trial. And what, we, what was observed is consistent with what has been shown in other studies and what we see in clinical practice uh, for patients who are receiving Lutetia-177 dotatate. The most common uh, side effects that were experienced by patients receiving Lutetia-177 dotatate included nausea, uh, diarrhea, and fatigue. Um, also importantly um, looked at were some of the adverse events of interest, including immediate hematologic toxicities. There were very low rates of grade three or higher immediate hematologic toxicities. Only 2% of patients had a grade three or higher thrombocytopenia, uh, leukopenia, or neutropenia. The um, study investigators also looked at the presence of secondary hematologic malignancies, which is always a concern uh, for patients receiving peptide receptor radio unified therapy. There was only one case of a secondary hematologic malignancy that was reported in patients receiving Lutetia-177 dotatate. There will be important follow-up uh, to follow because we also recognize that some of these uh, secondary events may occur after longer-term uh, follow-up. Looking further into the results of the NETR2 trial, it's important to recognize that the benefit of Lutetia-177 dotatate was evident for patients who had both grade 2 and grade 3 neuroendocrine tumors, as shown on these figures. There also was a benefit for Lutetia-177 dotatate that was evident in both patients who had a primary pancreas neuroendocrine tumor and a small intestine neuroendocrine tumor. This next uh, table shows that the response rate to Lutetia-177 dotatate was maintained across uh, various grades, grade 2 and grade 3, as well as primary tumor site. Uh, the response rate to, grade, to Lutetia-177 dotatate in grade 2 and grade 3 uh, tumors was over 40%. Um, the response rate in pancreas neuroendocrine tumors was 50%. It was slightly lower in patients with small intestinal neuroendocrine tumors at 26%. But this is still um, a high response rate, particularly when we consider how it uh, stacks up against some of the other agents that we use, such as somatostatin analogs or molecularly targeted therapies. In the last part of my talk, I will focus on targeted agents in neuroendocrine tumors and the expanding role of tyrosine kinase inhibitors in the treatment of neuroendocrine tumors. This slide um, illustrates the targeted agents that we use to treat uh, neuroendocrine tumors or that have been studied in neuroendocrine tumors. And these primarily include the tyrosine kinase inhibitors that have activity against the VEGF receptor. This is an important target given the highly vascular nature of neuroendocrine tumors. The other important target is um, mTOR pathway because we recognize that this is an important signaling pathway that drives growth and spread of neuroendocrine tumors. Um, the mTOR pathway can be targeted by agents including uh, tempsarolimus and everolimus. Everolimus has been studied in several randomized trials in patients with neuroendocrine tumors. The RADIANT-2 trial evaluated everolimus in patients with advanced neuroendocrine tumors that was associated with disease progression and carcinoid syndrome. The RADIANT-3 trial evaluated everolimus in patients with advanced pancreas neuroendocrine tumors. And the RADIANT-4 trial evaluated everolimus in patients with advanced gastrointestinal and lung neuroendocrine tumors who did not have a carcinoid syndrome. So these were essentially non-functional GI and lung neuroendocrine tumors. As you can see from the slide, both the RADIANT-3 and the RADIANT-4 trials were positive studies that showed a progression-free survival benefit uh, for everolimus. In the RADIANT-3 trial, the median progression-free survival for patients receiving everolimus who had pancreas neuroendocrine tumors was 11 months compared to 4.6 months for placebo. In the RADIANT-4 trial evaluating advanced non-functional GI and lung neuroendocrine tumors, the median progression-free survival for patients uh, receiving everolimus was 11 months compared to 3.9 months for placebo. As you can also see from the slide, the objective response rates to everolimus are uh, low. They're single digits. So why would these agents, while everolimus can be used to slow disease progression, very rarely will we see an objective response. I'll move next to reviewing the data regarding tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Sunitinib um, has been approved for use uh, in pancreas neuroendocrine tumors based on the results of a phase three trial uh, that evaluated sunitinib compared with placebo in patients with 
advanced and progressive well differentiated pancreas neuroendocrine tumors. As you can see from the slide, student NIB improved progression free survival compared to placebo. The median progression free survival was 11.4 months for patients receiving student NIB compared to 5.5 months in patients receiving placebo. Similar to what was seen with Everolimus, student NIB also has a fairly low objective response rate. It was 9%. Surafatinib is another tyrosine kinase inhibitor that has been evaluated in randomized trials in neuroendocrine tumors. The SANET trials were randomized studies that were conducted in China that evaluated surafatinib in patients with extra pancreas neuroendocrine tumors. This was the SANET EP trial and pancreas neuroendocrine tumors. This was the SANET T trial. Both of these studies were positive studies that showed that surafatinib improved progression free survival. The median progression-free survival for patients with extra pancreas neuroendocrine tumors treated in the SAN and EP trial was 9.2 months, compared with 3.8 months in patients who received placebo. In the SAN and EP trial, the median progression-free survival for patients receiving surfactant was 10.9 months, compared to 3.7 months for patients receiving placebo. The response rates um, to surfactant in the SAN and EP trial that were observed was 10%, and it was 19% in the SAN and EP trial. These data led to the approval of surfactant for the treatment of extra pancreas and uh, pancreas neuroendocrine tumors in China, but uh, surfactant is not approved for use outside of China. There have been other trials evaluating tyrosine kinase inhibitors and in neuroendocrine tumors that I've summarized on this slide. The results of the phase two trial evaluating pazopinib and lenvatinib showed promising results, although this has not been carried forward into a phase three setting. More recently, we uh, presented the results of studies evaluating the efficacy of cabozantinib. This is a multi-kinase inhibitor targeting the VEGF receptor, CMET, Axel, and RET. My colleagues and I recently presented the results of the phase three cabinet trial that evaluated cabozantinib in patients with extra pancreas NAT and pancreas NAT. In this study, there were two cohorts of patients one with extra pancreatic NAT and pancreatic NAT. Patients were randomized to receive cabozantinib starting at a dose of 60 milligrams daily or placebo, and treatment was continued until there was disease progression. Patients who were enrolled in the study included those who had well to moderately differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. Grades 1 through, disease, through 3 disease was allowed. All patients had progression prior to study entry and had received at least one prior FDA-approved systemic treatment for their disease. Concurrent somatostatin analog therapy was allowed. The primary endpoint of the study was progression-free survival. The characteristics of the patients who are enrolled in the cabinet trial are shown on this slide. If we focus on the extra pancreas neuroendocrine tumor cohort, most patients had GI primary uh, neuroendocrine tumors. A little over half had GI primaries. About 20% of patients had lung neuroendocrine tumors. There also were patients who had unknown primary tumors, thymus neuroendocrine tumors, and tumors arising in other rare sites. Most patients had grade one or two neuroendocrine tumors, and there were a small number of patients that had grade three tumors. With respect to prior therapies, most patients in the EPNET cohort had received prior somatostatin analog therapy. Most, but not all, had received prior lutetium 177 and dotatate and everolimus. If we turn to the pancreas neuroendocrine tumor cohort, again, most patients had grades one and two disease. About 10% of patients had grade three disease. With respect to prior treatment in the pancreas neuroendocrine tumor cohort, most had received somatostatin analog therapy. Uh, most had uh, received lutetium-177 dotatate, everolimus, and chemotherapy with temozolomide with or without cytokine. The results of the study are shown on this slide. Um, as you can see from these figures, cabozantinib significantly improved progression-free survival in patients um, in both cohorts. The hazard ratio for progression-free survival in patients in the EPNET cohort was 0.38, correlating with a median progression-free survival of 8.4 months in the cabozantinib arm compared to 3.9 in the placebo arm. In the pancreas net cohort, the hazard ratio for progression-free survival was 0.23, correlating with a median progression-free survival of 13.8 months compared to 4.4 months. In subgroup of analyses that were done in the EPNET cohort, uh, benefit for cabozantinib was seen in uh, subgroups that were important based on demographic factors and tumor-related factors, including grade, as well as primary tumor site, use of concurrent somatostatin analog therapy, and prior therapies such as everolimus and lutetium-177 dotatate. 
Similarly, in the pancreas neuroendocrine tumor cohort, the subgroup analyses showed that cabozantinib demonstrated significant efficacy um, in demographic subgroups and also um, tumor-related factors such as GRADE, as well as prior therapy, such as um, prior everolimus, sunitinib, lutetium-177, dotatate, as well as in patients who are receiving concurrent somatostatin immunolog therapy. The confirmed objective responses seen in the trial are shown on this slide. In patients with extra pancreas neuroendocrine tumors, the response rate to cabozantinib was 5%. It was 19% in patients with pancreas neuroendocrine tumors compared to 0% uh, confirmed responses in the placebo arm. The treatment-related adverse events that were observed on the study are shown on this slide. In both cohorts, the treatment-related adverse events, considering all grades that were observed, were similar to what's been observed in ca with cabozantinib in other disease settings. Some of the more common treatment-related adverse events included fatigue, diarrhea, ALT or AST increase, and hypertension. The higher-grade adverse events that were observed in the EPNET cohort included hypertension, fatigue, diarrhea. In the pancreas neuroendocrine tumor cohort, we also observed a small number of patients who had grade 3 or higher thromboembolic events. So in closing, I just wanted to return back to the case, um, Peter, with an advanced grade 2 pancreas neuroendocrine tumor. He was initially treated with a somatostatin in the log and after disease progression received treatment with lutetium-177 dotatate. As we think about Peter and other patients with neuroendocrine tumors, Important points to keep in mind are that there are multiple systemic treatment options that can be utilized to treat advanced neuroendocrine tumors. These include somatostatin analogs, like Peter received, uh, targeted agents such as uh, Eberolimus or tyrosine kinase inhibitors, cytotoxic chemotherapy, and peptide receptor rated implied therapy. As we think about treatment choice, it's really important to keep in mind patient related factors disease-related characteristics, and our goals of therapy. Sometimes the goals of therapy are to slow disease progression, and sometimes the goals of therapy are to reduce disease burden. In cases where there is more extensive disease or where, where our objective is to try to achieve an objective response, agents like chemotherapy or peptide receptor radium nuclide therapy may have a higher objective response and chance of meeting that goal. Also important to keep in mind is that as we make treatment decisions, a multidisciplinary approach, which integrates input from various specialties such as medical oncology, nuclear medicine, surgery, and radiology, and other disciplines is critical. I think one important point to keep in mind is that treatment options for patients with advanced neuroendocrine tumors are expanding. I think we've seen from the NETR2 trial that was reviewed today that frontline lutetium-177 dotatate for patients with high grade 2 and grade 3 GI and pancreas neuroendocrine tumors may be an option. In the past, we commonly had utilized lutetium-177 dotatate to treat patients who had disease progression after a somatostatin analog, but there may be benefits. There may be patients who could benefit from earlier incorporation of lutetium-177 dotatate. We've seen from the results of the CABINET trial that cabozantinib may be a new treatment option for patients with previously treated both extra pancreatic and pancreatic net. This is true across a number of different primary tumor sites and grades. In the future, we will need studies to um, evaluate efficacy of novel agents, identify predictors of treatment response, and look at optimal sequencing to help us to refine treatment decisions for our patients. So in closing, I'd like to thank you for participating in this program on emerging strategies for patients with neuroendocrine tumors. Please remember to download the slides and practice aids at peerview.com. Thanks again for participating, and I hope you found this information useful and informative for your practice. Thank you for listening. Remember to download the slides and practice aids and complete the post-test for instant credit. This activity is certified by PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. This educational activity is supported by medical education grants from Exelixis Incorporated and Novartis Pharmaceuticals Corporation. To access all materials for this activity, visit peerview.com forward slash ZDG 860.